John, thank you so much for being on with me today. How are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yeah. Of course. I'm excited to talk with you about your history in, ju in jiu-jitsu. Tell us, uh, for those who don't know, tell us your name, your rank, and your lineage. Yeah, so uh, I'm John Ralph. Um, I've been training jiu-jitsu for a little over 14 years now. Um, I came up through the Pedro Sauer Association. Uh, my, my main instructor was a gentleman by the name of uh, Jared Enfield. Uh, he's definitely my strongest influence in jiu-jitsu. Um, trained with him for the first uh, nine years, almost all the way to black belt specifically with him. And wow. then we moved to San Diego and uh, I, he called me up and said, we have to get your black belt done. And so we, we traveled up to um, Portland and uh, Pedro was, uh, Professor Sauer was having a seminar up there and Jess and I uh, got our black belts actually on the same day, um, which was, uh, that was quite rewarding. It was, it was fun. Yeah, which I think is a beautiful thing. So you got your black belt with your wife on the same day. Now, can you confirm or deny this rumor? I don't remember where I heard this. Okay, but I remember some, somewhere in the depths of my brain, I remember hearing something like, you were eligible for promotion before her. I think you started training even before her. And yeah. so you'd been at it longer. You were kind of eligible before, but you really wanted to hold off until you guys could get your belt together. Is that true? It, yeah. I mean, it is for sure. I, there, there was two things kind of motivating me because I'm a, I'm kind of a silly person sometimes, but um, <laughs> so I was a blue belt for exactly one year right around. And then I was a, or excuse me, a white belt. And then I was yeah. a blue belt for two years. Mm -hmm. I was a purple belt for three years. And I was coming up on being a brown belt for four. So yeah. I, was, I was pushing it off as much as I could because I thought it was kind of funny to have one, two, three, four, and then get my black belt. But, um, but yeah, so one of the things that I tried to use to push it off was, well, I'll, I'll wait for Jesse as well. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but she was, she was very deserving. I mean, uh, being a black belt at the same time. So my instructor, he saw through that pretty quickly and said, all right, you're both doing it. So, yeah. I, uh, which I think actually perturbed Jesse. <laughs> she was <laughs> a little, uh, cause she didn't want to do it yet. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's, that's how we did it. Um, in the, in the Pedro Sauer system, is there, uh, kind of a formal, um, testing for black belt? How, you know, how does the Pedro Sauer association work in that regard? Yeah, so for, for all the belts, Pedro has different um, uh, metrics, if you will. There's, mm -hmm. there's usually a, a, an amount of time on the mat and then a demonstration of, of techniques. And so in the blue and the purple, it's a very specific list of techniques that he would like to see. And uh, uh, the black belt, however, um, basically the last time that Professor Sauer went and visited Elio Gracie, uh, Elio said that he wanted – to have the self-defense being, you know, always prominent in, sure. in uh, Pedro's jiu-jitsu. And, and the way that Professor interpreted that was my black belt test is going to be uh, the self-defense techniques. And yeah. so uh, there's the, the Gracie, I think they call it the Gracie master text. And that's essentially, that's essentially our test. You flip mm -hmm. it to page one and lots of punch block defenses and, and all of those, uh, type of self-defense uh, techniques and so that's the way that's the way we do it um yeah you know, uh, there's i think i think there's different schools have different opinions on things like stripes and tests and everything else i always appreciated it i liked the formality of it i liked yeah. uh particularly with our students i liked showing off how hard my students worked mm -hmm. um you know and allow them to have their you know, their moment in the time, uh, you know, to, to, to have their promotion. Um, you know, so I, I like the formality. I understand that yeah. necessarily, but I, I enjoy it. Yeah. Would you say that the self-defense was a strong presence from the beginning for you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, by the time, by the time we had done our black belt, you know, I had done all of those techniques really ever since day one white belt. Mm -hmm. My, my instructor, I think was, just remarkable. I was so lucky um, mm. to have been introduced to this gentleman, Jared, uh, up in Idaho Falls. You know, I was living in uh, a little town called Pocatello, mm -hmm. Idaho, and Idaho Falls was about 45 miles away. And I would drive up three times a week to go and train with him when I started. 
Um, and, and yeah, it was, it was always just something that he was very, he was, he was very, um, dedicated to two things. I would say, um, the technique, technical jujitsu, like, uh, no muscle, no spazzing out, you know, right. make sure you're doing it kind of, uh, uh, the correct way. And then, uh, the self-defense aspect mm -hmm. that was, mm -hmm. that was his two real big, I mean, from jujitsu perspective, he was also yeah really good human being and he modeled that sort of thing as well uh he's just an all-around really nice man um yeah yeah he's a how huge did you did me. he did he introduce you to jujitsu how did you discover jujitsu and then how long did it take you to start training well so um <laughs> i was in college i was in graduate school and uh we were kind of standing around at a social mixer and uh i was lamenting that i had you know started to gain a little bit of weight and uh didn't like that i had played competitive racquetball for a long time. And then when we moved to Idaho, I couldn't find anybody to play with. Um, yeah. And uh, one of my friends who was also a graduate student in physics, he, uh, he said, Hey, I, you should come try jujitsu. I was like, what's that? Uh, you know, I, I had no idea what it was uh, yeah. actually. And so when he took me up to class, I literally kind of walked in and, and met Jared and put on the, you know, put on the suit and, I was like, what is this? And then it, it's kind of like wrestling, you know, that's, that's what I was thinking at the time. And so I tried to wrestle. Um, I wasn't a very good wrestler. Let's be very clear about that. Uh, <laughs> even, even back when I did wrestle, I was mediocre <laughs> at best. Uh, but, but I thought, ah, you know, in wrestling, you lose weight all the time. Right. Jiu Jitsu, this will do it for me. This will, this will help me reach that goal. So for me, it was purely just weight loss. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, about a month in or so it wasn't about that anymore even though that was happening it was man i was just hooked i was really hooked yeah good time good workout had but, you discovered or had any interest in martial arts or the ufc or anything like that previously you know funny enough uh a long time before that one of my friends in college is like dude you got to see this this ultimate fighting stuff and we went to blockbuster yes and rented vhs <laughs> tapes yeah. And we rented like Classic. the first four of them and, and we were watching. He's like, you got to see this little guy. It's just this little dude wearing this goofy little outfit and he's beating all these big guys up. <laughs> so, you know, I, but, but the, funny enough, even though I was very impressed by it at the time, yeah. it was not even, I mean, it was still six more years before I tried jujitsu. Yeah. You know, and, so it was entertaining, uh, yeah. but it didn't, it didn't quite grab your attention enough that you wanted to get involved at that time. No, I think I was still like most Americans. I was very, uh, I, I very much looked at it like, well, karate and Kung Fu yeah. and Bruce Lee. And, and that's the way that you do things, you know, sure. this idea of, um, you know, in fact, funny enough, uh, the movie with, uh, Mel Gibson, where he, uh, he gets the triangle choke at the end of the movie on the bad guy. I remember distinctly watching that movie going, what is this nonsense? That's just, that's, <laughs> that would never work in the real world. Yeah. You know, so yeah, funny enough, it was just, it was purely more accident than anything. It yeah. had a, it had a vague resemblance to wrestling. I knew what wrestling was mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I remember growing up and always being really interested in the Bruce Lee films. Um, you know, you had mentioned something. It was a little harder to get a hold of that stuff back then. I mean, if it was rated R, you know, you had to have a parent or older yeah. brother or somebody who could like rent it for you or, you know, happen to catch it on, you know, HBO or what a Cinemax or Showtime, you know, you'd yeah. have to like try to catch it at the right time. Um, but it is interesting how the culture of martial arts in the United States was predominantly Kung Fu or karate based, very striking based. And certainly boxing was very popular. Sure. And then in the nineties, um, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu just kind of came on the scene and shattered all of that. Um, yeah. I remember my brother-in-law uh, many, many years ago, he had studied Kung Fu for a long time and he was trying to show me some basic kicks and punches and, and I remember for me in my brain, it just didn't seem to make a lot of sense. I just, I, I, the, the punching and kicking to me, so it just felt like a lot of calculations. And, uh, you know, how do, I, how do I ensure that his chin is going to be there at that moment when I need it yeah. to be, you know? And, um, and there was something about jujitsu for me that just kind of clicked more in my mind. Like it just seemed to, to be more accessible to, to my understanding of how a fight might happen. 
Um, so you had a little bit of wrestling experience. Did you, did you feel like that played into that for you? Like it was, was it kind of natural, even though it's a different beast altogether, did it, did it kind of naturally flow for you? Well, no, <laughs> actually, uh, <laughs> it did not. Uh, because, uh, so, so yeah, night I mean, one. Uh, do you remember your first day on the mat? Oh do you remember yeah, what was absolutely. going on in your mind? Yeah. I remember it distinctly. I remember thinking, I, I can't get a hold of these guys. I mean, I get a hold of them. <laughs> it didn't matter. It didn't, right. it, didn't, it didn't matter how much I tried to pin them, you know, because wrestlers are trying to, you, you're trying to turn people on their back and hold yeah. them in place. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter. He could, yeah. this guy could just sweep me and move me around. And he was never where I thought he was going to be. And, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I do, I, I remember distinctly uh, about the second or the third practice, I remember saying, well, what I'm trying to do is not working. <laughs> I'm going to do it their way. And, yeah. and, and from then on out, I was lucky. I was just, I was, I was lucky that I had an influence that, you know, they weren't there to teach me the efficacy of jujitsu. They were just doing jujitsu mm -hmm. and the efficacy was demonstrated simply by them doing it. And mm -hmm. when I was, you know, being the typical night one guy, particularly a wrestler, they just put up with it and, and just, you know, as, as a lot of people's first nights are, they just, they just mangled me. Right. And, uh, and, and, and something that was interesting about our school is, you know, I think the jujitsu revolution, obviously, for Californians happened much, much earlier. I mean, mm -hmm. in the podunk, in the podunk <laughs> bill where I'm from, yeah, you know, you didn't have uh, a world champion everywhere you looked. In fact, my instructor yeah. was only a blue belt when mm -hmm. I started. Mm -hmm. Now, he had been a blue belt for four or five years by that yeah. point in time. He was a very dedicated trainer and he was very dedicated to ducking belts. Yeah, uh, he still is actually. He's very good at, <laughs> at ducking his promotions. Um, but uh, so they just they just had a way of running the school where the the you know if if it would have been a nutrition school, I wouldn't have stuck with it. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is schools that schools that where the tough guys just survive. Right. And they beat up on the weak guys and the weak guys float off or you get injured, something like that. I would have never been able to, I'm, I, I know myself, I just wouldn't put up with it. Yeah. It, it, it's, that's not fun. I don't sure. know anybody that thinks that kind of thing is fun. Yeah. Uh, and so by going into a school where it was much more, I don't know, nurturing, I guess, if you will, mm -hmm. where the, the fundamentals and the ideas were what was important, not how tough you were. Yeah. And eventually you became really tough. Yeah. Because of that. Yeah. Um, now you do need to be put in the fire at some point. Don't get me wrong. You have to, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be on night one. And I sure. Think, yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's where I got really lucky is to have an instructor that, that could do those kinds of things. Yeah. You know? I'm really curious. You mentioned that idea of how jujitsu probably took off like crazy in Southern California, you know, having a high density of Brazilians coming here to set up their schools and all that. And, you know, being battle tested, being, you know, going to Japan and fighting or being in the UFC and fighting and really being able to test themselves. I'm really curious about what it was like in Idaho. Where did you guys get your source of instruction? Did Pedro come through frequently, not frequently? Like, how did you guys sustain? I feel like if it were me running a school as a blue belt, it would, it would probably be maybe sometimes... Um, even a little discouraging not having access to that vast, you know, uh, wealth of knowledge that we had in, in San Diego or in Southern California during yeah. that time. So how, what kept him going and how did he uh, stay, you know, on, on the top of his game? Yeah. So I guess the best answer to this question, it's, it's kind of one of those just odd flukes that happen in life. It's, it's, mm. it's a strange confluence of events that just leads inexorably to a, a particular outcome. But, so to answer your question, I think I have to back up. When when the um, when Ori and Gracie first came, uh, really came up. I mean, he was he was up in the '80s, then he went back home to Brazil, and then he came back again in the later '80s and uh, early '90s. And then that second time he came, he said, "Okay, look, all of us got to come." He brings his brothers. Uh, Elio came. All of these guys came. Well, Professor Sauer happened to come along with this he, he's a fresh brand new black belt at the time mm -hmm. and he described sleeping in orion's garage with uh with elio 
Wow. You know, they had like cots and basically they'd roll up the garage door and they would do jujitsu all day long no way. Uh, at, a, at a Horian's garage. Well, Professor Sauer just happened to meet somebody from Salt Lake City uh, in mm -hmm. Utah. And he realized that if he stayed in Southern California, that he was never going to learn how to speak English. He was never going to kind of do mm. his own thing. Mm -hmm. And this guy from Salt Lake said, hey, you should come up to Salt Lake. And so Pedro had been there for about, by the time I started, he'd been in Salt Lake for, I think, 17 or 18 years. Something okay. Like that. Wow. So he had a nice nest of really tough black belts about three hours south of us. Okay. And that's how my instructor, he had been to college in, in the Salt Lake area. Okay. He had trained at Pedro's school and wow. then he'd come back up home. And so, you know, uh, Jared would drive down constantly, um, yeah. you know, and we would make very frequent trips down to Salt Lake. And so that's, wow. That's how that kind of step stoning happened. But uh, yeah. in the entire state of Idaho, when I started jujitsu in the entire state, there was like three black belts in the whole state. Wow. Maybe wow. four, something like that. And they were yeah. all on the on the western side of the state, uh, clear over in Boise, yeah, Twin Falls area, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So, yeah, we were just by ourselves. Wow, that's amazing. I was just talking with Costa on uh, our interview a little bit ago about how um, – you know, I always really try to savor the moments that we have at Studio 540 because there have been many moments I look up and I see, you know, five, six black belts on the yeah. mat at a time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I know that we're in a different era of jujitsu. I, I get that, you know, but um, I just really hope that, you know, the newer members, the people who maybe are just starting out and studio 540 is their first place. I really hope they understand the value that they have. That's right uh, before them. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to guess one way or the other, but sure. I, I have lamented several times, you know, and in a joking way, but you know, there's always some truth to it is, is, you know, I can't believe how people, how lucky we are to have what we have. I mean, yeah. Studio yeah. 540 is not the, um, it's certainly not the traditional training experience. I don't think it's right. Uh, you know, and, and when you know no other way, I don't know that you can fully appreciate what Studio 540 is. Sure. Um, you know, it was very magnetic for us when we, you know, when we first moved to, to San Diego, uh, we trained with Eduardo Tellis for a year. Right. I, I, I had always, man, I had always admired uh, uh, Tellis' jiu-jitsu. It's just a beautiful, uh, he, he, for me, he was always so fluid, so... Mm -hmm just the way he would just move around. He was, it never seemed like he was it just effortless. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so when we first came here, I was extraordinarily excited to get to meet him for starters. I've yeah. never even met him. And then to train with him for a year was just, I mean, it was outstanding. Yeah. And, uh, and actually what happened was uh, one night Andre uh, came to class uh, at Tulsa. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, yeah. He just yeah. dropped in uh, uh, as, as Andre does. That's he knows cool. <laughs> yes, he does. And uh, so that was the first time I met uh, uh, Dre. And Dre and Tellus were talking about a position. And I was a brown belt at the time. So, you know, you kind of sidling up to see what you can learn <laughs> from, you know, these talented black yeah. belts. And uh, I just really enjoyed the way that, that Andre was talking about uh, the position. He, he, some sort of... Um, it, it was some sort of rear naked choke from the back and how he was doing it and how it, he was thinking about it. And I just really thought to myself, man, I really enjoy the way that this guy is talking about jujitsu. This yeah. is more what I'm used to uh, yeah. about how to talk about jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, through, through a series of, of other strange events, I ended up coming up to five, four. Well, w when you guys were doing uh, all of the free seminars, yeah. Uh, you know, I, of course, I was turning up to those because, man, who yeah. messes up a free seminar? That's crazy talk. Totally. And uh, and then Telus went on a, a two-month-long journey, one month to Brazil and one month to uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just like, well, you know, 540 is really close to my house. Yeah. Telus, Telus ain't going to be there anyway, so there's yeah. no reason to drive all the way south. And Yeah. Yeah, just kind of. Well, you kind of bring up an interesting thing about uh, the traditional model of a jujitsu club or an academy or gym or whatever you want to call it. 540 has kind of this decentralized 
instructor program. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. I, it's, it's decentralized from one single person. Whereas like if you go to a Gracie Baja or, um, you know, one gym that's owned by, you know, maybe a superstar name, when that person is sick or they're out traveling, doing seminars um, or whatever, then there's this kind of vacuum, you know, yeah. they've got to rely on their other, uh, you know, their, their next in line, their bench or whoever to, um, you know, pick it up for them. But a Studio 540, it's almost the opposite effect. I mean, for many years, we've seen it happen where you walk in to go to your normal class and all of a sudden you have some world champion who's teaching class. It was like yeah. a, a surprise. Yeah. Like, wait, oh, who? how did this come about? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, being the social media guy, like I often didn't find out even until sometimes the same day <laughs> when I walked in. Yeah. Um, but it was really cool to see that happen. And I know that, you know, my short experience with um, our gym before it was Studio 540 was that we had one instructor. And, um, you know, we kind of had the same small group of guys that were training. Um, but over time, you know, we became Studio 540. And I realized that this, this what we were building there was a totally different um, model, totally different, where yeah. we don't have one single instructor who teaches every single class. There's not one um, specific philosophy that's being taught. There's multiple philosophies being yeah. taught. So talk about that experience for you. What was that like coming from, you know, a small town uh, jujitsu club to San Diego and having, you know, a, a different experience with uh, the different gyms here? Yeah, no, I mean, so I think you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's interesting because even if it, aside from when you get the special, you know, uh, fancy name teaching the class or so, yeah. um, you know, I constantly go to other people's classes because I like the way, I like to hear the way one, uh, Jake thinks about jujitsu or yeah. Andre or Aaron or Jesse, you know, yeah. I, you know, I've been training alongside with Jesse for, you know, like I said, about 14 years now, a little over. And mm -hmm. she still says things that I, I can't believe. I'm like, I, how have I not ever heard this? <laughs> you know, so, so having that, I think more diverse um, input from all sides, it allows you to not be stale for starters. I think mm -hmm. a lot of times what, what people have a tendency to do is to buy into their own, buy into their own shtick, if you will. I think that's yeah, the yeah, way yeah. to say uh -huh. it. Yeah. You know, but if you get stuck in this idea that you've got it all figured out and you don't need to learn something else, man, you, you're going to have a rough day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that, that's something that was really always very cool about professor Sauer is he, he always pushed that on us mm -hmm. all the time. He, he, he is very, um, very clear at his seminars and stuff that he appreciates very much our loyalty and he appreciates very much us coming to him, but he's like, you need to go to other schools. You need really? to go here. Oh, absolutely. Really? Professor, professor is extraordinarily, uh, from my perception, he's extraordinarily comfortable with who he is, yeah. what he offers. He knows that his students, um, if if he mm -hmm. pays the loyalty to them, they'll pay it back in kind. Yeah. It's not an expectation, but he sure. definitely appreciates it. He says, it yeah. And so, and he talks about, you know, when, when Helson's in town to give a seminar, he closes his school. He goes and trains at Helson. You know? <laughs> I mean, and this yeah. is a guy that's been around jujitsu for, man, he'll, he'll, he'll probably have forgotten more jujitsu than I'll ever learn. <laughs> and, and he's packing up his gi like he's a white belt, excited to go see somebody that he's known all his life. Wow. That's, that's the kind of model and the influence. And so mm -hmm. I think we were uniquely prepared for the 540 experience in that regard. Yeah. We didn't buy into the whole Crianche nonsense. That's just, that's silly. Yeah. Uh, that's just, that's just nonsense. And maybe it was a way that it happened back in the day, but, it doesn't, it doesn't happen that way anymore. You've got to be comfortable with who you are. Right. And that your students are going to come back because of what you're offering, not because of your name or your fanciness or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I would, I'm so new to jujitsu. I've only been at it for eight years, but <laughs> I have this, I have this theory about, you know, the, the closed doors, the competitive nature and I don't know if it's if it's true or not. And and maybe I just haven't asked the right people who who grew up during that time period. But um, I guess I just feel like with today's generation of jujitsu or this chapter of jujitsu that we're in, everything's accessible anyway. 
So even if you are locked in at kind of a cult like school where you're not really allowed to train elsewhere, uh, you've got YouTube all day long. You've got, you can yep. go buy Keenan's course online. You can go get AOJ online, whoever, you know, you could literally learn the concepts and philosophies from multiple different places um, all from home. And I think maybe in the old days, this is again, just my theory. I don't know if it's true or not. I think in the old days, maybe people felt like they needed to protect their philosophy of jujitsu a little more, because if we're going to be competing against each other, I don't want to tell you, you know, how I do this choke or what I'm looking for when I compete. Um, do you think there's any truth to that? Maybe what do you think is really the root of the whole Creanche thing? You know, I mean, of course, the things that you're saying absolutely probably factor in, you know, the, the, the competitive back in the day, the competitive nature of people, they thought if I don't let my opponent know what I'm working on, then, you know, I can surprise them or something like that. But, you know, the fact is, is that grappling arts have been around for two or 3000 years. Sure. You think you're thinking of something that somebody's <laughs> never seen before. Yeah. You just, you're delusional. You, yeah. You, I guarantee you there's nothing in jujitsu that hasn't been tried. I'll guarantee you yeah. that. I mean, yeah. a great example of this is De La Hiva. Mm -hmm. If you go look at judo books from the 1890s, from the 1900s, mm -hmm. you can see De La Hiva. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so to think that you're going to have something special that nobody else can offer mm -hmm. in terms of techniques, no, that's, that's just silly thinking. And so I, yeah. think, I, think, I think that people just fundamentally, they get scared. They don't want to what if they like that guy more than they like me? Mm, what if, interesting. What, you know, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the small town, you know, Jesse and I ran a school in, in Pocatello with our friend Keith. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we ran it for about five and a half years. And there's only two schools in that town. There's us and a Gracie Baja school. It was then a, uh, he, he had three or four affiliations. Um, mm -hmm. He's a nice gentleman. We got along just fine. But, uh, the, the, the two way street wasn't there. I, yeah. I would train over there all the time. Yeah. I was happy to go meet him and say hi and yeah. Hey, how's it going? You know, that sort of thing. But, uh, I, I think that people get scared sometimes sure. instead of, instead of yeah. letting their own, instead of letting their own personality, their own kindness, their own teaching style, let that mm -hmm. be the attraction to the students right. uh, along with your technical aptitude. I mean, look, you can't be, a, you can't be clueless. You have to know something. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things I really loved about Studio 540 is is having such a variety of influence on my instructors. I, mean, I can tell, I can see the DNA is different among my yeah. instructors. And, you know, you got a guy like Jeff Higgs who, um, you know, he has a unique style of his own. He, he, he's got kind of a brutal, tough style of jujitsu. And then, you know, you've got... Dre, who's I, th I feel like he's on the other side of that. He's got like nice guy jujitsu. Like he's gonna well, get you. He's gonna get yeah. you. Yeah. He's not messing around, but yeah. he does it in the nicest way, and he and yeah. he does it with in a in a way that. And I like the way that he explains things too, you know. But um, you know, I I I I never take that for granted because I know that we do have something kind of unique and, and something special. And what I've loved is sampling the different types of instructors at 540 over time and kind of figuring out what appeals most to me, what kind of game appeals most yeah. to me, what type of teaching style, what class format really works for me best. And, um, and that is there for me. And whoever else has different likes and dislikes and different preferences they have something for them as well i feel like there's something to kind of fill in the gaps for everybody i mean i i encourage everybody uh you know you got to train in all the classes yeah mm -hmm. you, you really need to uh a lot of people really get stuck on well i only want to train with jake because of x and and i love jake's class i go to jake's yeah. class all the time yeah but if you if if you only train with jake and not go learn from aaron you, you, the only thing you're hurting is yourself. <laughs> yeah. You, you're missing amazing jujitsu from another practitioner that learned it from a different source. Yeah. And, and that I think is, is exactly what you're saying. This is, this is what is unique about studio 540 is if, if you lined up all of our instructors side by side by side, and we chose a basic technique, mm -hmm. 
any any technique that you want to think about an arm bar a sit up sweep or whatever mm -hmm. every single one of us is going to have a different detail a different a nuance a different idea on what mm -hmm. makes it really tick and and to me that's what makes it so amazing is i'll go and see how dre does something i'll be like i've been missing that aspect i thought i had that dial right i've been missing that whole aspect now for years yeah and uh, and that's what's unique because like you say we we all came from so many different sources yeah. so many different influences and uh that's truly unique that's mm -hmm. uh, that's what i think is the strength of, of of us rather than relying on one wellspring of information you have yeah. so many different uh looks at the same thing yeah absolutely um you've got me inspired actually that sounds like a fun video series to do take each of our instructors yeah and okay guys you're going to teach us the basic arm bar go and just but, have each of the you gotta, keep, you gotta keep them all separated so they don't, see, <laughs> they don't no. see what the other guy did and say oh i gotta say that exactly too. You know, you exactly yeah, no i think i think it would be very very interesting because i have i have done this i've seen you know, I've seen Jake's take on a certain technique and Aaron's yeah. take on a certain technique. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting because I'm thinking in my head, hmm, you know, that's not the way I wonder about that. Right. And, and, and then to say, wow, that, you know, obviously that is very good. That's very strong. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's where the jujitsu grows from. And that's, you know, you mentioned Jeff. Jeff has probably been one of my largest influences of my own personal jujitsu for the last several years now. I yeah. think that, um, I think it's very easy to be intimidated by Jeff, mm -hmm. but he is literally a walking encyclopedia of jujitsu and judo and sambo yeah. and I mean and 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 the guy yeah. is truly the embodiment of a martial artist. He knows yeah. so many great things. He's so humble and talented. Now, don't get me wrong; he's also very tough. <laughs> he's he's exceptionally <laughs> tough. He really yeah. is. But man, you you can't stump that guy. You can ask him any question you like. Mm -hmm. You can't stump him. He knows yeah. the answer. He's, yeah. Or he, he's at least got an idea for you to go along with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, about I, Jeff, uh, there's, I have this, uh, there's this thing I have about Jeff and that is that I think in every one of his classes, there's an oh shit moment yeah. where he's teaching, he says something like kind of on the sly and everybody kind of like their eyes like get big and they all kind of look at each other like, did he just say that? Like, I yeah. remember in one class, he was like teaching like a self-defense thing. And he kind of got into this idea, this concept of his former military days and hand-to-hand -hand combat. And he said, he literally said this. He's like, and you know, you get here and you just rip that ear off. Yeah. And like everybody in the room was like, we just kind of looked at him. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. rip the ear off yeah. i mean he's giving you that as an option he's not saying do that he's just no, saying of course not. that's there it's available yeah. to you but um and, and yeah, I, go think ahead. That worked against, I think that worked against him a little bit at the start because i think that everybody got lost in that in that spectacle of what he said and they didn't understand that the jujitsu that they were being shown mm -hmm. was just of the top-notch quality yeah. yeah and that's and that's like i said it worked against him a little bit that people couldn't see through the spectacle mm -hmm. of the interest of what did he just say? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, because, um, like I said, he, he, he does an extraordinarily refined, uh, expression of jujitsu. I think Yeah. everything is, is as simple as it can possibly be and no simpler. Yeah. There is, there is fundamentally, generally speaking, when I, when I learn something from him, there is no complication. Mm -hmm. there's it's just you do this then you do this then you do this it's very yeah. it's very effective and linear and like i said people people got intimidated by the the the, the true self-defense expression of sure. jiu-jitsu yeah and they didn't realize man there's some beautiful stuff here that i can use it i can use it in sport i can use it in yeah. mma if i were mm -hmm. to fight certainly in self-defense yeah. and that's i think that's why i'm drawn to jeff so yeah. much is yeah. because of the fact that it's is very much self-defense oriented right I like that yeah very, i like that a lot on that topic of taking the same technique and having each of our instructors teach that technique i think one of the things that has um that i've observed about myself over time is that um you know as we've grown as a team at 540 i think in the beginning i used to take someone's instruction as the way that it is 
right? Like when you're a blue belt and someone says, here's how you do a triangle, here's what's important. You go, oh, okay, these are the important things about a triangle. And then, you know, maybe years go by and you learn, you have another fundamental class uh, on triangles and it's from somebody else and they say, no, this is really what's important about the triangle. And I think over time, I look back and I think in the beginning, I used to take things so literally about jujitsu. And being at 540 kind of helped me see these are just tools that are available to you and you're going to find something that works for you. You're going to take these little pieces of the puzzle, put them together. You're going to take these tools, put them in your toolbox and, and use those later on down the road. So I've seen that kind of evolution in my understanding of jujitsu. I'm curious what has changed in your evolution of uh, learning or your evolution of jujitsu over time? Maybe what was an early mindset as a white or blue belt that you look back at now and you realize it's totally different than you once yeah. thought it was? No, I mean, yeah, this is, this is another one of those instances where I was just super, super lucky. Mm. Um, you know, we obviously followed the Pedro Sauer curriculum. Professor Sauer had the white to blue DVDs and he had the blue to purple DVDs and you wow. could watch them and you could see great techniques. And then you could ask Professor Sauer about the same technique and he'd show it a different way than his DVD. Wow. <laughs> also because his, his game and his understanding has probably evolved since that was published, right? There it is. Wow. And, and, and that's the, that's the thing. So I, from, from my formative always of jujitsu, it was presented to me as these are some fundamental rules mm -hmm. of things that, you know, there, there are in, in every technique, uh, I believe this, every technique is fundamentally built up of very small building blocks. There's a few things that build every technique in jujitsu. And, and you can call those the, the fundamentals and you can call them the, the building blocks or you can call them the rules. Mm-hmm. So for every single technique, there's some rules and you can't break those rules. Sure. Now, how you get in between the rules is very, very up to your own expression of jujitsu. Right. There's certain things you just cannot do with an arm bar. Otherwise it won't work. Right. But once you follow those rules, you can do all of these other things and that arm bar might become infinitely more effective or infinitely more difficult to escape or anything else. And so by you know, again, going back to this idea of seeing all these different, different instructors showing different ideas is if you boil it down to the, some, to the portions of the jujitsu that they're showing, you're going to see the rules. Mm -hmm. You're going to see that the rules are all the same. When I teach a triangle and when Jake teaches a triangle and Jesse teaches a triangle, you're going to see fundamental rules that cannot be broken. Mm -hmm. You're also going to see interesting nuances in how you get to each little portion of the technique. Mm -hmm. And that is what's so important about, you know, seeing everybody's expression yeah. and seeing every, how everybody does each little thing and not getting stuck in, well, you know what? John told me it was this way. Yeah. So I'm not going to listen anymore. As soon as you right. put on those blinders. Yeah. 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 You're going to ask yourself for some trouble because, and, and this is, this is what I say constantly in my class is like, this is what works for me guys. Yeah. I hope it works for you. I hope there's something out of this technique enhances mm -hmm. what you mm -hmm. understand yeah but but you're not me any more than i am you sure and, uh, you know. and i think that was an important lesson for me to understand as well that as a student um my instructors are presenting ideas and concepts and and, and as a student i evolved from you know taking things so literally and trying to just put it all into a formula that i realized that really through all of this, a lot of them were saying like, hey, get creative. You have shorter legs than I do. You're gonna have to figure a different way around this, you know? Right. Um, how much of jujitsu would you say? Like if you had to prescribe a, a formula for creativity and um, technique or fundamentals, like how would you kind of split that? Would you, would you say it's a straight down the middle, 50-50 creative and 50% um, you know, fundamentals? Would you say that a lot of it comes through, uh, a lot of your jujitsu has come through creativity or more fundamentals? Like, how would you split that? I mean, how much space do we have in jujitsu for creativity? Oh, I mean, obviously there's a great deal of space for creativity. I mean, going back to Telus, I mean, look at, yeah. look at the types of interesting things that he does with his jujitsu 
to uh, really, really befuddle opponents. Right. That being said, I can't do the same things that, that Telus can. For instance, Telus can just sit down and put his head down between his legs. Mm. Enormously flexible man. I can't. <laughs> I cannot possibly do that without going to the hospital. <laughs> So I, you know, I have to be influenced by small portions of his game, not the whole, yeah. not the whole thing. I want to emulate portions of it. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think you have to be creative, mm -hmm. you know, to adapt your own body type to what you're being shown. I mean, Jake's quite tall. I'm quite not tall. Mm -hmm. So I can't do everything the same way that Jake does it, for instance. Yeah. It's not to say that Jake's doing it wrong. That's absurd. Right. Absolutely. And it's also not to say that I'm doing it wrong. Well. That's not nearly the same. <laughs> but the the so, but I I, I think there is a, f a fundamental thing that I would like to express as well. Your your you you mentioned with your personal journey that you're now starting to step into that more creative plateau where you got to kind of change change it around for yourself. And I think that I think that when you're very first learning jujitsu, you just need to do what you're told. Mm -hmm. Do it the way I'm showing you. Yeah. Try it out just play with it. Just right. do it this way. Yeah. And it's going to fail a whole bunch of times because the other guy knows what you're trying to do, but mm -hmm. just do it this way. Yeah. And then as you get more and more and more experience of why it's failing, what's failing, asking about it, trying it some more, doing yeah. it. Yeah. Then you start opening up that avenue for a little bit of creativity. I think it, uh, by way of an analogy, I, I really like analogies, but mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're a white belt, you're very, you're primitive. All you're learning how to do is to say words. That's it. <laughs> you are literally learning dog and cat and ball and, and that's it. That's all you're yeah. doing. Yeah. And when you're a blue belt, you're starting to form sentences. Yeah. You're starting to see the cat run. You're starting to throw the ball to the dog. You're starting to do those very simplistic, you know, sentence buildings. And in this case, you know, maybe a sweep straight into mount straight into a choke. Yeah you starting to see that progression, but you, you didn't make up that progression. You were shown that progression. Yeah. And then by the time you're a purple belt, you're starting to speak, not just in complete sentences, but you're starting to choose how you want the sentences structured. Yeah. You're starting to put the sentences in order that you like. Yeah. And, and then brown belts, they're starting to tell stories now. Brown belts are very much putting together short stories, maybe some small novellas, things like that. Yeah. And then we would like to think that, that black belts, they're writing poetry. It's different. Mm -hmm. So, so with that analogy, I think it kind of hopefully gives an idea of what I think about that question. At first, you just have to learn the words and yeah. you didn't know the words. So why would you question the words? Right. When I give you a technique or when, when anybody gives you a technique at your white belt level, just absorb it, mm -hmm. try it the way that you're shown, see if you can get it to go. And then the words start coming more freely. The sentences start being formed. Mm -hmm. purple belts the brown belts and then and then hopefully the expression so the creativity should always be there at some level yeah. but you have to rein it in and say okay i i need to do what i'm showing because i don't know any better anyway yeah that's a beautiful analogy i love it it's it's much more eloquent than uh i i would have thought of um it i really... wish i could take credit for it but again <laughs> <laughs> i stand on the shoulders of many many that came before me my yeah. instructor jared yeah, uh, used to talk about great. that. And I think yeah. I do. I believe that it's a very nice way of thinking about how jujitsu progresses. Yeah. Now I've heard, of course, only being a purple belt, I'm, I haven't experienced this uh, maybe quite like you have, but, you know, I've heard that, um, you know, even among black belts, there are, are levels. I mean, obviously oh, there's yeah. the logistics of stripes and how many years, you know, you've been a black belt and things like that. But I'm wondering when you got your black belt and you started training with black belts, did you notice some nuanced changes either in the ways that people trained with you or things that you noticed now among black belts uh, that you didn't notice before? Well, I think <laughs> the first thing happens when you're a black belt is no matter what you say, people seem to listen. <laughs> it's, 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 it is literally this, this, uh, this perceived notion that everything that's going to come from my mouth is going to be perfect. So yeah. It's going to yeah. be the mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. And that's, you know, that idol worship, I think is, is kind of, is actually a little bit of a, a problem in jujitsu. Sure. That's my opinion. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. But yeah, there, there's there's obviously huge differences amongst black belts in jiu-jitsu. I mean, yeah. I, look, 
from from a very early age of my own jujitsu, I realized I'm never going to be a world champion. I'm never going to be a medal chaser. I'm never going to be a world beater. It's just not me. Mm-hmm. I don't have the, the the toughness, the fortitude, the, all the things that those top athletes need to have in order to be the top athletes. I didn't have. I don't have those things. Mm-hmm. It's good to be honest with yourself and see these things. I did enough tournaments until I finally won a very small tournament. There was two other guys. Uh, I got a buy in the first round. Let's be very clear. I finally <laughs> won one as a purple belt. And I, the only thing I said was, thank God I, can, I don't ever have to compete again. And I, haven't, I haven't competed since yeah. then. Wow. Because that is not what drives me in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. I, I love doing it simply because it's fun. That's it. Mm-hmm. it. It, I stay in good shape. I have great friends. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoy learning things. I, uh, I, I just, that's enough for me. Other yeah. people, they are motivated very heavily by uh tournaments. Again, neither one's right or wrong. It's not the point. Yeah. But so my goal has always been in jujitsu is I want to be a great teacher. I want to yeah. be a person that I learn things and I explain things and and when necessary, I modify my own thinking about things, uh, which is, you know, it's necessary all the time because jujitsu, you can learn great deals of change with very small details. Um, and so that's, that's always been my goal is to be a, I'm not the toughest guy in the world for sure. I mean, you know, competitive black belts, they, they make me feel like I've never done jujitsu ever. <laughs> You know, I, I don't you, even know that I've ever attempted jujitsu sometimes with those guys. Do you do you have a moment maybe training with uh, one of the the people who came through for a seminar? I'm just wondering if you have any insight of what it was like to train with somebody who is you know at that top world stage level. Um, you know, because at 540 we've had a lot of people who come through and they'll do a class and they'll actually train with everybody afterwards. And sometimes that training can be kind of limited where it's maybe either positional or they're obviously just kind of rolling for fun. Um, But I don't know, what what was that? Have you had any of those experiences at 540 training with someone? Um, What was that like? Oh, I mean, well, the the opportunities and experiences for starters have just been phenomenal. Um, Yeah. For starters, just just rolling with our own black belts. I, True, I, I'm we've got a pretty amazed. deep bench there. Yeah, yeah, I'm constantly <laughs> amazed at the kinds of things that that our black belts can. Do. I really, am. yeah. Um, but but that being said, I mean, I've got an opportunity to roll with Gordo, mm-hmm. um, which uh, that was that was mind blowing to me. It was m- unbelievable what that guy could do. Yeah, you know, um, how easily he was able to just and he showed us his game. Yeah. In the seminar. Yeah. And then he just did it to me. I <laughs> knew what he was doing. And I, yeah. there was nothing I could do to stop it. Wow. And I got an opportunity to roll with uh, Keenan one time. And, mm-hmm. and I, I stood up over the top of him and man, I hung my gi down and made sure that he did worm guard. And when he started to wrap <laughs> it up, I asked, I was like, this is it, right? Because I'm, you know, I'm not super savvy with that sort of thing. I don't yeah. do a lot of very fancy stuff. I wanted to feel it. I wanted mm-hmm. to see what it was like. Yeah. And so, yeah, no, I mean, again, I'm, I'm extraordinarily realistic on the fact that if, if I gain a position on, on, you know, Keenan let me in side control, he let me have an arm bar from side control. Yeah. Interesting. He didn't let me, he didn't let me finish the arm bar. Sure. Let's yeah. be very clear about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but to the outside observer that wouldn't see what's going on, they think, Oh my God, that guy's got Keenan in an arm lock. This is a really tight, close match. Yeah. Come on. It's no. silly talk. It's absolute yeah, yeah. nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, I mean, opportunities rolling with those guys. It is absolutely astounding to me to see what different people can do with jujitsu. Yeah. You know, we've talked about Jeff, we've talked about Dre, we've talked about all these guys, how effortlessly they can make certain things happen. Like we all know what Dre's going to do. He's going to pass us. Mm-hmm. He's going to leave us in a little bit of a half guard and pin that leg down. He's going <laughs> to grab our collar and he's gonna yep. hunt that choke. We all yep. know he's going to do it. Yeah. My God, it's tough to stop it, though. And yet, we all get caught in it. Exactly. (laughs) You talked about uh, how teaching drives you quite a bit in jujitsu, and and it's not so much the you know chasing medals and championships and things like that. Um, and and you talked about the language of jujitsu. So there's something that came to mind for me. I've had limited um, opportunity to teach jujitsu, but I have had 
some opportunity to teach adults and then certainly to kids. Um, and one thing that, that I noticed as, a, as an instructor was that there were moments that were clear to me I needed to just bite my tongue and keep it simple. Like I know more of the detail that they need, but that's too much for them at this point, yeah, right? Sure. Like teaching them how to say, you know, the, the dog went running after the ball that you threw or whatever, you know, so you, you, you try to teach them too much. It's like, they don't, com they don't comprehend it. Right. Yeah. So we we'll talk a little bit about your philosophy as an instructor. I mean, are you sizing up the, the rank in your class? Are you kind of modifying on the fly? Um, are you taking some feedback from your students during class to kind of maybe augment the, the instruction a little bit? How does that work for you as an instructor? Um, and, you know, kind of talk through your mind mindset as an instructor. Yeah, I mean, for sure. So I, um, so I started teaching absurdly young in jujitsu. Um, <laughs> absurdly and, young. <laughs> well, again, this is, this is yeah. one of those things that um, I suppose two things kind of factor into this. I was, so when I was an undergraduate, when I went to, to undergraduate school, uh, I was going to be a teacher. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I taught high school physics for two years uh, before I went back to graduate school. Mm -hmm. So I already had a teaching background and I like teaching. It's, it's just something that I, I really like to do. So I had that. And then again, being in kind of like Podunk, Idaho, mm -hmm. when uh, Jared, my instructor, started up the school in Pocatello, so his, his first satellite school, um, you know, drama always seems to follow jujitsu. I don't understand <laughs> why, but, but we had our drama as well. And Jared had his first set of blue belts. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that first set of blue belts who were also from Pocatello, they were going to be the primary instructors at that school. Now, keep in mind, Jared had only been a purple belt. For so long so to us having a blue belt instructor that was very normal yeah ordinarily normal to us well drama ensues those two blue belts end up quitting and jared needed an instructor and i mm. was like a three strike white belt and uh it, it, for perspective in the pedro sour associated time we did we did eight stripes on your white belt really you had you had four stripes on the black bar and then you got a blue bar and you got four stripes on that so each wow. stripe was basically 10 hours Wow. And uh, so I, I hadn't had jujitsu for much more than 50, 50 or so classes. Yeah. And uh, I taught my very first class and Jared, Jared called me up and he's like, look, man, I can't get down there. You got this drama going on with these guys. They're not going to be there. I need you to cover class. Wow. And I taught an Americana. And uh, looking back, I still remember the details that I talked about. You know, that was my understanding of it at the time. Yeah. But I certainly teach it differently now. I mean, yeah. You know, yeah, it's, it's slightly more refined, I would hope. <laughs> so um, I've been teaching jujitsu almost as long as I've been doing. Jiu -jitsu. Wow. Yeah. Um, so so I, I, I'm lucky in that regard. Mm -hmm. but yeah, no, exactly what you're saying. So, you know, I, when I come to class, if I'm going to be teaching that day, I have an idea of what I would like to see on that particular yeah. day. Um, you know, I, I, I have the advantage of kind of coming up last in the week on Sunday. And so I kind of have an idea of what everybody else has shown throughout the week. So I can either refine some things or I can, you know, I, I, I have a little bit of, uh, but sometimes you'll be doing the warm ups, and I try to tie my warm ups into the, the move of the day, let's so to speak, mm, cool. or, um, you know, and I'll, I'll have made some assumptions on what people are coming into the class with. Yeah. And it'll become apparent that the assumptions were, just that sometimes assumptions are, uh, you know, not, not very good. And yeah, and yeah, you gotta, you gotta modify because if you just stick to the, if you just stick to your mental script, mm -hmm. regardless of what's going on, uh, you, you're not going to have a very, you're not going to have a very rewarding teaching experience and the students aren't going to feel like, I mean, I think, I think the instructor first and foremost has to understand that you are there for them. Mm -hmm. It's not the other way around. They're not yeah. there because of you. You are there to serve them. Mm -hmm. and if you're not giving them what they need to improve as athletes, to improve as, as jujitsu practitioners, whatever it is that they're searching for in their own personal mm -hmm. jiu -jitsu, then you're failing. I don't care how good your techniques are. I don't care how tough you are. If you're not there for your students first, yeah, you're failing. Yeah. And, uh, and so you, you do have to read the room. You have to okay, uh, the idea that I had at first, this doesn't make any sense because I've got, <laughs> I've got 17 new white belts here for the first 
first day. You know, yep. sun, Sunday seems to have a lot of drop-ins. Oh, and, interesting. Uh, yeah, well, I think I'm lucky because I don't think there's a lot of jujitsu on Sunday. Yeah, I think true. I'm kind of I'm yeah. the only game in town. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And every and every, everyone who has a corporate job or kind of a you know normal nine to five, they're off on Sunday and probably yeah. looking for something new. Yeah, yeah. And that's I mean you know uh, I'd like to think of course that they're coming because of my exceptionalism. Of course, uh, I'm sure I'm sure <laughs> that the uh, no other choice weighs in as well. Yeah. But yeah, no, I mean uh, I think that teaching is one of those things where it's. Uh, is 20% actual knowledge and 80% acting like you know what's going on. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think that, um, you know, you being a teacher from so early in the game, you know, I wonder, I just feel like that had to have made you a much better practitioner. I feel like anytime I've had an opportunity to teach, it changes the way I understand the concept it also forces me to dive a little further into the concept and why I do it this way versus that way. And what have I been taught and how to articulate that to somebody. So a lot goes on up here in the brain about that technique. I feel like that makes it stick better. I feel like you understand it on a deeper level. Oh, yeah. How much do you think that played into your game as a, as a jujitsu practitioner? Oh, no, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's invaluable. I think, yeah. I think to truly, truly understand something, you have to try to teach it. Yeah. If, you can't, if you can't teach something, I think, I think that's actually an Einstein quote, if I'm not mistaken. If you can't teach something, then you don't understand it. Mm. That might be a bit of a strong statement because some people are more naturally gifted to explain things than other people. It's right. not that the other people don't know. It's just that they're, that's not their gift, let's say. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think that particularly when people ask questions, yeah, um, you know, you, you, you then have to kind of basically say to yourself, do it the way I showed you and don't ask these questions. <laughs> yep. You yeah. know, it, in other words, just ignore the fact that they just talked or you, you have to think about it and go, huh, why is that? You know, mm -hmm. how do I, how do I modify an Americana? Uh, I've, I've taught um, people that only had one hand, mm -hmm. the other hand, you know, the other hand was non-existent. Yeah. I've trained with guys that, that only had one leg. Mm -hmm. How do I teach a triangle to guys only got one leg? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so by, by being able to reflect on those kinds of situations and scenarios, yeah, you, you, you naturally become better at the jujitsu for sure. Mm -hmm. It's funny. You mentioned, um, you know, just, just, just do it the way I told you kind of thing. I've been, I've been told that before. I mean, I've, I've had those moments in class where I thought like, Oh, I, I, this same instructor taught me another detail about this same technique. And Oh yeah. I, I, I want to just like tell them, I remember what, you know, we, yeah. and I just, I remember a couple of times just being told like, well, that's great. It's not what we're doing today. You know, like yeah. that's not, yeah. that's not what we're doing. Like, yes, it's kind of related, but that's not what we're doing today. Yeah. So focus, you know, it's, it's um, a very, it's a very fine, it's a very fine line. It really yeah, is because yeah. I want, I don't want to, I don't want to just, um, discourage my students from bringing me something that they, you know, Hey, you said this and it made me yeah, think yeah. about that. Mm -hmm, and something mm -hmm. like this. I certainly wouldn't want to discourage that. What I do find very difficult to deal with on the mats and it's typically upper belts that do it quite frankly, mm. is they do the technique. So, so, so particularly in my classes, I always like to, to split up the colors mm. because what, what invariably happens if you don't do this is the purple belt wants to stick with his favorite purple belt friend. The brown belt wants to stick with his favorite brown belt friend. <laughs> And then the Guilty. white belts are just standing over in the corner going, what the <laughs> hell is going on here? They haven't so been I, I initiated like to, yeah. yet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody gets split up. Everybody gets to, it gets yeah. to grab. Um, and, 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 and to a certain level, you owe it to the jiu-jitsu community. Yeah. When you're an upper belt, you only got there, of course, by your own perseverance. Let's, let's not disparage that. But you got there because somebody else helped you. You yeah. got there because a different colored belt at some point in time took you aside and showed you something and helped you something and helped clarify your, so you owe it. You have to pay it forward when yeah. you get to that level. But what I have a real tough time with is when the upper belt grabs the lower belt and goes, I know that's what he just showed. Well, oh. look at this and look at this and look at this and look at this. Mm. And now I've got a dancing monkey in the corner <laughs> doing great jujitsu, probably mm -hmm. interesting things, 
but the white belt is not getting their learning experience because the white belt's not getting, you know, the technique of the day, let's say. Yeah. And so, so there is a very fine line when you're in somebody else's class. Yeah. I, I've been in other people's classes when I don't necessarily agree with the way that they're showing it. Sure. But when one of the students asks me, I say, this is what we just learned. This is yeah. how you're going to do it. Yeah. Whether yeah. I agree with it or not, is not mm -hmm. the point. I'm there. Uh, particularly if if somebody asks me i owe it to the instructor to do it the way they show yeah and uh, and i might talk to the instructor later and say hey man what do you think about this what do you think about that sure um, yeah and they might change my mind they might say yeah. look you're wrong and here's why yeah and that's that's been known to happen of course. yeah it's interesting there's all these cultural norms within our little subculture right mm -hmm. yeah. i mean going to someone's class and you know picking your partners some some instructors pick uh, partners to drill with and and then you have the whole thing of like you know well they said it this way but I do it this way kind of thing and then there's also the uh, after class you know kind of the, the bonus the bonus rounds and there's the after the bonus techniques and stuff that, you know that happen afterwards uh, study hall is, as some might call it you know when they're picking the brain of the the instructor or whatever um, do you think it's important as a, as an instructor I mean you know, you've kind of outlined it, what you think there, but um, how active of a role are you taking in pairing people up either for sparring or for drilling the technique? Mm, it depends. It depends. I, I do admit that it's actually something that I, would, I need to get better about, particularly during the sparring, because I have an expectation that everybody in class behaves themselves and everybody yep. that rolls in my class, you roll a very specific way. There's yeah. no medals. There's no, so if, if I get the perception that you don't, that, that you're not embodying the way that I would like you to be doing jujitsu, then I, I make some matchups and cut people loose. Yeah. And um, because I, I think that everybody should be able to roll with everybody. Mm -hmm. And we should know that at the end of it, everybody ties their belt, shakes hands, and everybody smiles. Yeah. It doesn't mean you didn't have a tough train, it doesn't sure. mean that you weren't challenged, it doesn't mean any of those things. But what didn't happen is you never even once feared for your safety. You never even mm -hmm. once feared for like, I'm going to get hurt doing this. Yeah. And uh, so it is something that I feel like I want to do better is, is making sure that the matchups are always square. But for the most part, people understand the expectations in my class and I make it very clear and I reinforce them all the time. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't have a lot of troubles with that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think what one of the things that, uh, in general, a lot of jujitsu schools could do better. And, you know, I think we've gone in and out of, um, this phase as well, or, or in and out of, um, dealing with this challenge at 540. but just a personal opinion of mine is I feel like one thing that we could do better is, uh, white belt or beginners assimilation or, um, you know, orientation. Uh, yeah. I remember how intimidating it was to, even just the, the thought of walking into a gym for me was so intimidating. Mom. So to like walk, to actually get the courage to walk into a place and get the gi on and figure out how to tie your belt and then step on the mat. There's so many things that we take for granted because we've been at it for so many years already. We take these things for granted. And then we have somebody who walks in and they're like, I have no clue what the customs are here. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do yeah. right now. So I think one of the things that you and Jess have done really well is really helped our newer members figure out how things work and where their yeah. place is. Um, so talk to me about your heart behind that. Cause it's something I, I've, we've never talked about, but it's something I've just observed about you guys is that, you know, it seems very important to you that beginners have a place to start and understand, you know, how things work. Yeah. Well, uh, again, this is, this is what we were modeled. Uh, from from the very get with our jujitsu and our instructors that everybody was taken care of everybody yeah. felt like they had a place that 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 you were welcome that you yeah. all of these things if you we, we were very much of the of the um, of the custom if you will of if you're cool I'm cool you respect me I respect you we're all going to have a great time I'm not going to try to kill you you're not going to try to kill me you know all of those things to try to take a little bit of that intimidation off. Yeah. Um, but, but, but the one thing that I would like to say about you before I finish answering the question, one thing I'd like to say is I think that people also assume that 
black belts or brown belts or purple belts even use. Well, maybe I don't know but for you. Maybe maybe it's something that I'm mistaken on. But when I visit other schools, because I, I travel for work a lot, and I yeah. try to train when I'm traveling because I yeah. don't nah, – I, I love jujitsu. I don't ever want yep. to. <laughs> and I'm – my heart, man, it's beating. It's pounding away. I'm standing there in line. Guy, hey, here's the guy, you know. And, yeah. And it gets worse with every belt. You asked that mm. question earlier too. Mm-hmm. The target on you gets massive. Yeah, yeah. Because because everybody wants to tap a black belt. Sure. Everybody wants that first scalp. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, and and they'll uh, come after you, and they'll come yeah. after you, and and more than one time, you know, more than one time, Jesse's been the target of of some mm. overzealous uh, training partners. Yeah. And um and yeah, that's that's uh. It's not good. It's not healthy. To do right. that. And so, right. so in, in, in our, in my classes, and, and I know Jesse does this as well in her classes, we make it very clear that that's unacceptable behavior. And we yeah. remind people every single class. Mm-hmm. I, you can pretty much ask any of our regulars that when I start rolling, I, I say to everybody, be cool. I don't want to hear about this. I don't want to, I don't want to hear spazzing out. I don't want to hear anybody say, ouch. Yeah. I don't want to hear those things. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, having that expectation, reinforcing that expectation, demonstrating that expectation, mm-hmm. I think is 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 critical as well. Because it's not it's not do what I tell you and watch me do something different. Right, right. You know. Um, so there's there's kind of a couple of things I've observed in in our our jujitsu culture, and that is that some some gyms are like you throw them into the deep end, they'll figure it out. And others are like, no, here's our program for beginners. I feel like with a program for beginners, if you start out with the type of mentality that you're talking about, you know, hey, we're here to care for each other. We're here to learn from each other. Here's what I want to show you today. Here's some basic things to understand. Here's, here's, here's mat culture. Here's yeah. jujitsu culture. Here's, here's what we do. We do a hand slap and a fist bump. And here's what sparring means. I feel like all of that breeds... Um, a much safer environment for everybody, not just today, but in the future, because when that white belt becomes a blue belt and a purple belt, they're going to remember the way that they were taught. Kind of like you were saying, you know, it's like they're, they're now paying it forward in a different way versus a mindset, which might think, well, you know what, they, they gotta, they gotta earn it, you know? It's my turn to, you know, it's my time to shine and I get to beat up a white belt today and they're going to have their turn one day too. But today's, you know, my chance, yeah. you know, and, and I know that a lot of that has to do with personality and the, it, my personality is not one to take advantage of people or beat people down or discourage people ever. So um, I know that maybe in my mindset, it's different than somebody else who comes from a very strict fighting culture. Um but, you know, I think that having a program for beginners is a really important thing for a school. I think you're going to keep people longer. You're going to keep people longer just because of their loyalty and because of their health. They're not going to be broken and injured. There you go. <laughs> there you go. But then they also pay that forward again in the future and they treat white belts kindly. Yeah. I think one of the things that people lose sight of is, is if we're going to be honest with ourselves and we look at the demographics of a school. Yeah. So, like I said, Jesse and I ran a school for five, you know more than five and a half years in Pocatello. We, we were, I guess, relatively successful. You have to look at the demographics of your school. Mm-hmm. In your school, you're going to have less than, generally speaking, 5% of people that are like that. I want to go to tournaments. I want to win. I mm-hmm. want to you know, really succeed. And great. Awesome. Yeah. I will help you with that. I will. I will help you with the skills that you need to go and do jujitsu. Mm-hmm. Cause it's not like I teach you some sort of different jujitsu that I'm going to teach you. <laughs> yeah. Right. But the rest of your school, 90 to 95% of your school are guys like me mm. and, and, and Jesse and you, mm-hmm. you have a day job. Yep. You have something else that you do. And jujitsu is your escape from that day job. So true. It's the place that you go to where you want to relax. You want to be with your friends. You want to get mm-hmm. a good workout in. You yeah. want to learn something useful. You want to practice your skills. Yeah. And, and so for me, when you recognize that that's the largest portion of the demographic of your school, yeah. if you're going to go with that in attrition model or mm-hmm. just everybody for themselves. And you know what, if you manage to dodge injuries long enough, good, good on you. Yeah. Now you can be the tough guy. Yeah. I, it's not my way. I'm, yeah. I, I try not to be judgmental 
everybody yeah, can yeah. do it how they want to <laughs> see fit. Yeah. But I don't think you see the most successful schools in competition being run that way. Mm -hmm, I don't mm -hmm. think, I don't think uh, uh, the guys that really dominate on the circuit are that way. And if you look at, if you look at the toughest competitors of our era across many eras, Calterra has a, he has an extraordinarily emotional video where he talks about his, you know, receiving his black belt and receiving uh, prior belts and things like that, where uh, he makes it very clear that that kind of more attrition mentality, uh, the toughest guy survives mentality, it's not acceptable. Right. I don't think it's acceptable. Yeah. I don't, I, I would hate to think that I drove somebody away from jiu-jitsu just because I'm going to prove that I'm a tough black belt. Right. I mean, that's pretty silly. That's yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm really not doing myself any favors if I do that because mm -hmm. I'm only as good as my training partners. Hmm. And so if I run all my training partners off because I train like an asshole, yeah. how am I going to get better at jujitsu? Right. I'd be like, I'd be like going into a basketball gym. And the first thing you do is stab all of the basketballs with a knife <laughs> yep. and then try to yeah. have dribbling practice. I mean, come yeah. on, mm -hmm. that's, that's essentially mm -hmm. what you're doing with that kind yeah. of mentality. Yeah. But again, the upbringing that we had from the Pedro Sauer association and from, from, uh, you know, Jared school, um, you know, this is just the expectation. This is the way, yeah, we, yeah, this is the way yeah. that we rolled. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it works. I think, yeah. I think it does create a lot of lifelong practitioners. Right. Yeah. How do you think that jujitsu has influenced you as a person, as a human, what has maybe changed in your mindset over the years of training jujitsu and, and maybe problem solving or conflict resolution or managing anxiety or anything like that on a personal level. Like what do you think has uh, jujitsu has done to transform you as a person? Um, well, I mean, aside from the obvious uh, physicality, I mean, right. You originally well, got into yeah. it for, for, you know, weight management and fitness. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, when I started this 265 pounds, that's what I weighed when I started. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I lost a lot of that weight. Uh, so, so that's the obvious one. Um, and then, yeah, it, I think that jujitsu has an interesting way of keeping you very much in the moment when you're, when you're doing jujitsu, when I'm, when I'm rolling around with Leon, I have to be present in that moment. Yeah. I have to be there rolling with Leon. I can't be thinking about, what happened at work that day. I can't be thinking about that guy that cut me off in traffic. I can't be thinking about, I can't be thinking about anything. Yeah. Rolling with Leon, because if I sleep on it, if I let my mind wander, yeah. if I don't stay present. I miss out on things. Mm -hmm. Maybe I get submitted. That would be the least of my worries, but maybe I miss some interesting nuances to the jujitsu. Mm -hmm. Maybe I miss something. Yeah. So if I were to take that, and approach life that way mm -hmm. to be more present in situations mm -hmm. in this conversation. What if I were to just wander off mentally? Yeah. So, so I think that jujitsu helps you to practice that presence of mind. Mm -hmm. It allows you to stay with the moment rather than yeah. floating away. I, yeah. I think that's a really strong thing. And yeah, I mean, conflict resolution, you know, <laughs> you, you, you really learn quickly that no matter how thing, how, no matter how tough you think you are, there, there'll be a kind of a, you know, skinny little guy. Maybe he, <laughs> maybe he blinks kind of funny. Maybe he has some funny mannerisms and you kind of take him for granted. And all of a sudden you're rolling with Ryan Hall and he destroys you. <laughs> yeah. You can't, you can't judge a book by its cover in jujitsu. You can't. And so again, this is another one of those humbling things where you, you think you're going to walk in and just, be the, be the hammer all day, but sometimes you're the nail. Mm. And so it, it, it instills a very strong sense of humility without breaking. You. Yeah. I think there's a difference between being broken down mm -hmm. and just being humbled a little, bring sure. it down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and at the same time, funny enough, even though you, you, you got a little bit more humbled, you still have that confidence. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you remind yourself that very few people do jujitsu. It's yeah. a very small number. Yeah. You know, we, we have, a, we have a, a, a tendency, a bias, if you will, to, to assume that everybody does jujitsu. I do it. You I do it. <laughs> everybody I hang around with does yep. it. Mm -hmm. So everybody mm -hmm. does it. And yeah. that's just not the case. I mean, 90, yeah. 
what, 95% of the world probably has no idea what jujitsu is. I don't right. know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so it gives you a confidence for sure. I'm curious if you've ever had to use your jujitsu in the wild. Not, not no. in any real way. Sure. I mean, yeah. you know, we've all been dumb as blue belts and you're at a party and one of your buddies is like, well, but you can't do that to me. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you learn, you learn very quickly that that's yeah. a very, that's a big recipe for disaster. Totally. Uh, yeah. That's a, that's a big recipe because feelings get hurt Yeah. and people get angry mm-hmm. and then something innocuous turns into something bad. And so right. I really try to stay away from those kinds of situations. Totally. Generally my answer is, uh, you know, oh, well, you could probably kick my ass. I'm like, no, probably not. Yeah, yeah. That's usually my answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I usually follow it up with, because why would I fight you? Right. Are you going to attack me? Yeah. Is that on your mind right now? Because I'd like to know if that's <laughs> on your mind. <laughs> totally. You know? Yeah. But no, I've, I've, I think the last time I got into a real fight was fourth grade. Yeah. Fifth grade bus yeah. stop. Yeah. You know, I, I'm really fortunate in that regard that I've never had to, I've never had to, I've gotten into mm-hmm. some situations where, you know, Jess and I went to lunch one time and, and some guy was coming out of a restaurant. Uh, I don't remember if he pushed or slapped at his girl or something like that. We had to get in the middle of it. Ooh, this guy man. lost, man, this guy lost his mind. He yeah. lost his mind. He, I'm telling you, he, he threw his cell phone up in the air. He threw his sunglasses. <laughs> And what it turned out to be was, uh, with my limited interaction with this gentleman, is he had bad PTSD. Uh, he just he just had a couple of parts. Yeah. But Jess and I were able to get in the middle of it, walk the young lady to her car. I kept yeah. the guy kind of at bay. Cops came. They chatted with him, diffused the situation. I don't think that I would have had the the confidence if jujitsu wasn't in my back pocket. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He said, hey, man, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. So... In that limited sense, I use jujitsu. I think that's I, I sure, think that's, absolutely, that's, absolutely. That's using it in a way, yeah. But I've never had to, you know, I've never had to get yeah. with somebody or anything. Yeah, like totally. There was a time um, a couple of years ago, or actually, it was only about a year ago. I was on a cruise for work, and I was after hours, and I was getting a drink, and um, these two guys had obviously been drinking way too much. And I wasn't with these guys. I was totally by myself and they were doing their thing. I I could feel the energy ramping up, you know, that drunk talk and the loud, you know, boisterous (laughs) kind of thing that's going on. And, um, and these two dudes, like they literally like started shoving each other and the girls are starting to scream and getting all involved. And, and I just remember in my mind going like, there's nothing you can add to this, Leon, like (laughs) your jujitsu is is great and all, but like, yeah. It's, it's not going to bring any real resolution to this situation. It's already ramped up way beyond yeah. logical thought. Security's on their way. I don't need to get a black eye or get involved in this. And I think that there was something in me that had a confidence of, I'm not scared. I don't need to run away, but I certainly don't need to get involved either. And I think yeah. that sometimes, you know, for people who don't train, there might be that temptation to like start shouting and guys 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 try to get in the middle of it and then you end up getting in the mix yeah. inadvertently and and i think i was just able to recognize in that moment man these guys are beyond you know speaking to speaking any logic to i'm gonna let security do their job and i'm just not gonna be involved in it but no i've never actually had to, to use jujitsu in public either but i do remember one time there was a guy who was trying to bust me for walking through this um private parking lot and it's kind of ridiculous, but he's kind of yelling at me like, Hey, you can't go through this way. And, um, and I was just playing it cool. I was like, what? I'm just going over here to the coffee shop, man. He's like, yeah, you have to walk around the alleyway. He's like yelling at me all this stuff, but he gets closer and he sees in my hat said surf fight jujitsu. <laughs> I think, I think that's what it was. I honestly think that's what it was because when he got close enough to read the hat, he's like, listen, 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 man, I don't want any trouble. Listen, I don't want to tr- <laughs> like, he was like backpedaling. <laughs> I was like, yeah. what just happened? It didn't even come to me or, or occur to me at that moment. I was just like, I think he read my hat and saw jujitsu and was like, Oh, I don't want to screw with this guy. <laughs> yeah. But no, I learned, a, I learned a lot of, uh, I learned a lot of different little rules. Um, you know, when I, when I go out, when I, you know, I don't go out a lot. I'm, I'm yeah. more of a homebody. But when I do go out with friends, coworkers, things like that, I never wear jujitsu shirts. I know, I know. I, I stopped wearing that too. <laughs> I never wear hats. I never, 
particularly, you know, there's, there's times that um, we would go and, you know, with, with some of my coworkers, we'd go watch UFC fights at, you know, at a bar or something like yeah. that. Man, my lips stay shut. I don't say <laughs> yep. I don't wear. I don't wear anything. I I cheer when everybody else is cheering. And, uh, you know, I I stay low key because you learn quite quickly that that if you if you open your mouth and you make it out there that they're going to be somebody, particularly in bars, particularly when al- alcohol is involved. Yeah. They're going to want to test you. They're going to want to do something stupid, and and I just. Uh, you learn those coping mechanisms to stay away from those kinds of things because sure. no good's going to come of it. Yeah. What, what, what yeah. If, if we look realistically at it, if we mm-hmm. look, if we look at it and we say, okay, what are the, what are the outcomes? Let's say, let's say that this guy picks a fight with me and I decide, okay, I'm going to test my jujitsu. Mm-hmm. What am I going to prove to myself? Mm-hmm. I, I on the regular roll with guys that are way tougher than me. And sometimes guys that are not tougher than me. And sometimes mm-hmm. my jujitsu is the one that wins out. Mm-hmm. So I, on, on a constant basis, mm-hmm. I am all the time testing, testing, testing yeah. jujitsu. Mm-hmm. What good am I going to find? What am I going to learn from a guy that's never even seen jujitsu before? Right. So the best possible outcome is my jujitsu works. I subdue the guy. And then what? I get nothing out of that. Totally. I get totally. nothing. <laughs> yeah. Now let's look at all the alternatives. When his buddy jumps in with a beer bottle, mm-hmm. when, when uh, somebody else jumps in, when that guy pulls a knife, when, unless you're backed into a corner, there's no reason to do it. There's right. none. Yeah. And, and in fact, even so, even so, you should always be trying to get away from it. And uh, is, is, like I said, it's, it's better to have it in your back pocket and shut your mouth about it mm-hmm. than it is to broadcast it and to, and to escalate. Right. With the person. Mm-hmm. If you right. start escalating with the person, you're going to, you're going to find out some things that maybe you don't want to find out. Yeah. hundred percent. And it kind of goes back to that idea of somebody challenging you as well. I've been in those situations at, you know, barbecues or whatever, and someone finds out that I do jujitsu. And usually it's some, you know, innocent bystander who's like, Oh, you do jujitsu. You used to wrestle. You guys should have a match. Like, no, no like that's not no. why i'm here at the barbecue <laughs> like i don't want this yeah. this is or, you know <laughs> yeah have you run into this one where, where you're going out and your buddy says well leon's with us he'll cover our back if something pops <laughs> off it's like what gave you that idea that i would help you if you smart off somebody. yeah this is your problem i'm problem. not your insurance policy exactly, for getting beat. <laughs> exactly you know i mean that being said it's nice to sit at a bar with all of your jiu-jitsu buddies sure. if everybody's being yeah. cool because if yeah. you, you know if something were to go you know pear-shaped you should, <laughs> they're going to be able to patrol the outside yeah. perimeter but you know yeah i, I think i think that one of the things that I always find funny, I went through it, every blue belt that I've ever talked to about it, they went through it too, is this, it, it happens right around when you get your blue belt, just get mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. You're walking around and you think, mm-hmm. man, I hope that guy tries something. I hope that guy tries something. <laughs> yeah. Boy, he won't even yeah. see it coming. Yeah. And, uh, and fortunately for most of us, nothing ever happens. Fortunately yeah. for me. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. yeah. you think you have it figured out when you're a blue belt. You do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I thought I had it figured out. And uh, man, I probably, again, I probably had to learn some things that I wouldn't have enjoyed. Yeah. I think one of the things I've enjoyed uh, after these years of training jujitsu is just that level of um, confidence. And I'm not talking about bravado or being macho. I'm just saying there's a level of confidence that grows inside of you that, you know, you're walking in a parking lot and you see some random guy who could look suspicious or um, maybe threatening. Um, I'm aware of what's going on. I'm paying attention. I'm looking him in the eye, give him a nod and say, Hey man, what's up? You know, or, you know, some kind of greeting, some neutral kind of greeting. And I think there's something that's in me that, that has grown over time. Whereas I think maybe before I wouldn't have had the same level of peace or confidence in those types of moments. And I think a lot of jujitsu comes out in that form. And it's, it's rarely in the form of, you know, being able to defend yourself in some kind of weird bar fight. Cause it just doesn't, it's not, it's not going to come natural to us to get involved in that kind of stuff because we want to see peaceful resolution. We don't want to see people get beat up. We don't want to get in in the middle of fights and things like that. And um, 
you know, we're going to be more aware. I think, I think a lot of jujitsu, anybody who, tra- who practices a martial art, I think is probably more aware of when moments are starting to get escalated and maybe removing themselves from, you know, any kind of danger in that situation. But um, certainly jujitsu has, has been great for me in terms of um, a confidence booster you know, certainly being smashed by, you know, big hairy dudes, big sweaty hairy dudes makes me feel like, you know what, this little problem I have at work, not that big of a problem. Yeah. Um, and you, you're right, you touched on something that I personally love about jujitsu as well. And that is, you know, my daily work uh, as a photographer and running my business uh, service for photographers, I'm connected to the computer all the time, all day. That's where work revolves is, is around technology around screens yeah. um, around phones and when i step on the mats i can't be connected to any of that no. all of it goes away it's gone and i have to really like you said i have to focus on what's going on in that moment because if i don't i'm screwed there's something there's something very pure about that I, I am i imagine it to be akin to any type of manual labor you know, particularly farming, things like that, where you yeah. are just out there doing the thing. Mm-hmm. There is no, uh, there is no, there's nothing else. You, yeah. you have to do the thing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's, there's a certain purity to that. And I think, I think there's a certain grounding and, and, and jujitsu to a certain, I think, I think we, we hunger for that in our yeah. society. We yeah. hunger for, I think calling it a simplicity is is sounds disparaging but i mean it in the best possible way we hunger for that simplicity of i have this task mm-hmm. i will accomplish this task yeah and there will yeah. be no external there will be no external things to take me off of this right i'm going to do this thing yeah and um and and it's becoming exceedingly rare in our connected lives to be able to to find those moments mm-hmm. without a great deal of effort yeah uh, I fail myself at these kinds of things. I mean, how often do you shut everything off, even extra music, yeah. everything off, yeah. and just sit for a minute? Yeah. Most people can't do it. It's so true. You know, most people can't do it. <laughs> I, I notice. You know, I've, I've done I've done yoga for a lot of years. Um, yeah. Not not as serious as I probably should, but um, I noticed a lot of times that there at, at 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 the end of yoga, there's something called shavasana. Yeah. Uh, Corpse pose is actually what that means. Mm-hmm. And all you're supposed to do is just lay there. Yeah. That's it. And, and you're noticed, not even supposed to really be engaged in your breathing too. You're supposed to just let that flow naturally. Yeah. You're just supposed to, you're just supposed to be. Yeah. Nothing else is supposed to happen. And I noticed in a lot of classes um, all the time, I noticed that people during Shavasana could not do it. Oh, they interesting. Up, they, they, they just get up and leave. Oh. And I'm sure a certain amount of that was people that maybe had to get back to their job or maybe had to, you know, whatever. Yeah. But I think a certain percentage of that, honestly, is, is that we can't just shut down. Yeah. We can't. We, yeah. we have a really difficult time just being. Mm-hmm. Um, we always have to have a little something feeding us of those little dopamine boosts. We have yeah. to have those little... <laughs> We have to have those like buttons. We have to, and, and, <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm not trying to be a Luddite at all. I think that there's a place for all of these things, but I do believe also you have to find time for those bits of simplicity. Yeah. And, and again, I, I do believe that jujitsu offers that. I, I, I don't know if you've had these situations, but there's been times. Um, I remember one sticking out in my mind distinctly. Um, uh, Andre actually uh, invited me over to the small mat one night. This was before we had, you know, we have three mats at, at 540. The small room had just been put in not very long. I hadn't been a black belt for very long, I don't think. And Andre just pulled me over to the other mat and we rolled for 45 ish minutes. No way. Great. Wow. I mean, no rounds. Wow. No stopping. <clears throat> It was just, and even when there was a submission, we didn't even reset. We just kept going and going. And going. Wow. That and is I cool. Remember, I remember looking at the clock and then looking at the clock again and just boom. All the time was just going. Wow. And uh, when, you get into the, when you get into those kinds of, um, it, it, it's a bit like meditation, I think. When you get yeah. into those, yeah. that, that zone where nothing is happening but mm-hmm. this thing. Yeah. I, 
I think it's a remarkable, I think it's a remarkable experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's needed. It's something that we need to do uh, more often and, um, you know, certainly a great practice to be part of. John, um, we've covered so many topics today, man. It's, it's been awesome. Yeah. Yeah, but I love it. And um, man, I've just enjoyed getting to train with you and learn from you over the years at 540. Love your no nonsense style of jujitsu. You know, creative little guy like me uh, at Purple Belt, you know, trying all the crazy weird stuff and trying to integrate and, you know, experiment and all that. It's always very, very clear to me when I train with you that uh, I could simplify a lot more. So I appreciate that. In fairness, I did the same thing, man. Yeah. I remember watching YouTube videos and trying out Daily Heva and everything else on my instructor. He didn't teach that stuff. Yeah. And and his his simplistic, if you will, his his expression of Mm jujitsu, it always worked. And man, it didn't even seem like, no matter what I thought I could throw at him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. And that's how I feel with you too. You know, like when (laughs) when we get to train, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not mistaken in any way that I could, um, you know, best you in any way, but, um, you know, you, you allow me down these paths, you kind of show me, you know, here, this is open for you. I take it and I go walk through that door and I find it's a trap, but I, I also find that like, <laughs> you know, like the flashy stuff that I might be attracted to here and there. And I don't think that in general, I'm attracted to the flashy stuff of jujitsu. It's just that I think at purple belt, there's just so many things to explore and really starting to get an understanding of how things work. And so it's like, Oh, I want a little of that. I want a little of that. But when I train with you, it really reminds me that I don't need the flashy stuff. It's not necessary. It's not essential, at least for my game. um, Because um, I see how simple and boiled down your techniques are. And um, for me, it's, it's a reminder that I could probably, you know, cut off some of that flashy stuff out of my game and just go with some of the more simple stuff. So I appreciate your influence in that regard. Well, I, that's very kind of you to say. I, I think the flashy stuff has, it has its place in terms of you, you certainly need to be aware of it mm-hmm. because if somebody that's very good at the flashy stuff mm-hmm. starts attacking you and you're not sure what they're up to, right. it can be confusing. It can be difficult to deal with. So there is, there is merit obviously yeah. in, in trying out things that aren't your jujitsu, for instance. There's, sure. there's things that I practice uh, in other people's classes. And I'm like, well, I would not use this in my personal jujitsu. Totally. If I had to, but I'm glad that I tried it. I'm glad yeah. that I was exposed to it. I think that that obviously has value. That's yeah, a great yeah. deal of value. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a continual learning process, and I'm uh, grateful to have you along my side for that process. And uh, man, I can't wait till we can train again. Oh, me too, man. I, I miss everybody so much. It's, uh, you know, this, this, this truly has been such a huge part of both myself and Jesse's life. And James, he practically knows no other way. He, yeah. he started training very young. Um, when, you know, when I say that I've been training for 14 years, I mean that in every sense of the word. I've been very fortunate to not have any major injuries, to not have anything that really holds me back from training yeah in a week out a week in a week out yeah so this this is uh coming up on the longest in fact it is already the longest i've ever been away from jujitsu and it's wow uh, it's a very strange feeling yeah um because uh I, i'm not sure what the heck i'm supposed to do with my time <laughs> <laughs> I don't, this is this is when i would be doing jujitsu what i don't know yeah. what i'm supposed to be yeah, doing. yeah 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 exactly um, so uh yeah i i miss the hell out of everybody yeah. i can't wait to I can't wait to get back to training. I can't wait to get back to, you know, I was, it's funny that you mentioned it. I was messaging with, uh, with, uh, Jeff Higgs before you called and, uh, you know, we're both like going crazy yeah. <laughs> we're just going yeah. crazy. and we know, we know we're doing the right thing. That's yep. important to say. We know we're doing the right thing. Uh, there's no way to ever prove that this is the right thing, but we know it's the right thing. Cause yeah. you know, yeah. the count today was America's, uh, the United States is over 10,000 deaths now. Whew. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's getting, it's getting even more serious. Yeah. We are doing the right thing. It's painful. Mm-hmm. This too shall pass. Just yeah. like everything painful, this will pass. Yeah. I will be back at it and it'll be that time that we couldn't do jujitsu. But now I think maybe we're going to treasure it a little bit more too. <laughs> yes. For a little, for a little yep. while. 
A hundred percent. We're all going to be pretty hungry to get it. And uh, yeah. when we get back in for sure, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to dodge all the, uh, the hungry animals. Uh, <laughs> I know. Let you them, know, actually, let them all try to kill each other for uh, a while and then sneak in the <clears throat> sneak in the side door. Exactly. I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, man, are we gonna see a huge spike in injuries because everyone's gonna be just overexcited to train again? Uh, I hope not. Well, you know, here's the thing. It's it's interesting that you say that. One of the things that we'll all have to be honest about with ourselves mm-hmm. is we can't. We're not going to be able to do the same things that we did before we stopped. Totally. And because, you know, it's been my experience, and this is not always the case, but it's been my experience, that a high percentage of injuries are your own fault. Yeah. Every time I have had something that hurts, it's usually because I was being dumb. I did something that I didn't fully understand, or I didn't tap quite as quickly as I should have. Sure. You know, so when we come back mm-hmm. and when we start rolling again, not only do we have to make sure that we don't go get overzealous with our training partner, we have to make sure that we understand that our bodies have changed a bit. Yes. You know, I'm trying to work out. I'm doing my yeah. yoga. I'm doing kettlebells, but I'm not doing jujitsu. Mm-hmm. That's a different thing. Yeah. Jujitsu is its own thing. Yeah. You get, you get in shape for jujitsu doing jujitsu. Right. No other way. Right. And so everybody's going to have to remind themselves, I need to, I need to dip my foot in the pool, maybe not dive in head first. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Test the water a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. And I, you know, if people, if people come into it with that kind of attitude and perspective and uh, uh, people are going to be fine. Yeah. But, um, but there's, there's always people, there's always people that are looking to prove themselves too. So you gotta, you gotta keep an eye out <laughs> and make sure to keep yourself safe too. Yes. 100%. But I can't, I can't wait for it. I really can't. I think, it's going to be, like I said, I think we're all going to value it a great deal more. We're all going to, I agree. we're all agree. going to be very excited once it comes back and it will come back again. Yeah. All things like this, they go, they go away and we'll get there. And 540 will be there waiting for us. Open arms. Uh, yes. I can't, I can't wait. I can't awesome, wait. man. Well, it's been great talking with you today. Um, you be good out there, be safe yeah. and um, yeah, be in touch and hopefully we'll see each other in person really soon. Oh, sounds good, man. Thank you for thank you for the opportunity. This is fun. Yeah, thanks, John. Take care, man. All right.